Jacques stood above the eastern ensconcement, gazing across the high meadow. Far below, anger was being spoken. She knew that anger came from two older sisters who had over-visited with each other, but she could grasp no words, only intentions. Suddenly, from a completely different direction, she heard in her head the clang of armor, not just the jingle of a horse bridle and the bit, but armor. How did she know it was armor? Who in the world wore armor anymore? It sounded as if the wearer walked at a good pace, and with each step the armor sighed and creaked, rattling a bit. In the background were the winter forest noises. She listened harder. Was it two, twenty miles away? No mind invitation. She attempted to move to visual. No luck. Too far for taste and smell, still so comparatively underdeveloped anyway in her and among all of her sisters. All she could do was listen. The armor seemed to be moving faster now, the squeaks coming more frequently. And then, suddenly, nothing. Silence. She checked her listen spread and found it still operating. The forest noises were still continuing. The person had stopped. Not sat down or fallen, but stopped short. Could the person have heard her hearing her? No chance. Was her own breathing too loud? Was the armor wearer breathing? If so, why couldn't she hear her? Still she waited. Minutes went by. Silence. Then it seemed an hour. Jacques grew impatient. She was only beginning to train herself. Perhaps she was making some mistake. You're doing fine. The thought was enfolding her. Diana, she asked. Yes, I've been worry reading you. And you've been open. What you're hearing is really happening. Can you hear it too? I did. I don't know. I'd call up an extended ear and pay attention elsewhere. A person can stand still only so long, particularly in regalia like that. Diana passed off and away. Jacques was relieved. Gingerly, she summoned her extended ear, not like the more deliberate fan-like spread, but nevertheless a field sensitive to unusual noises. She opened it toward the armor's sounds. Still the silence. Now she was free to revisit her own thoughts. Could it be that it wasn't a woman at all, but a man, one from the city, standing stock still there within their wander ground? She tried to recall the lessons from the remember rooms, the stories, the mind pictures, the pain of some not-so-ancient days when the men owned everything, even the forests and the hills. It is too simple, she recited dutifully to herself, to condemn them all or to praise all of us. But for the sake of the earth and all that she holds, that simplicity must be our creed. That she dropped back into her first tellings when she was only a girl child and sat at the gatherings with her mothers in the singing and in the playing of the tales of the men. There ran a thread through those tales. We once had hope for them, but even that hope was snuffed out. Rage, sadness, all mixed with tenderness and love. Love men? The idea did not fit. It was uncomfortable and backward in her mind. 
She tried it on from every angle, but it would not be adjusted. Some of its bulk was sticking out over the sides, and other parts of it were just too short to approach the edges. And yet, somehow, it once had fit. It once had been so. Maybe it was a different kind of love, she mused. Or maybe they were gentles. Gentles. Men who knew that the outlaw women were the only hope for the earth's survival. Men who, knowing that maleness touched women only with the accumulated hatred of centuries, touched no women whatsoever. Once, she remembered, some gentles had come down to the wander ground, stricken and dying. Unwilling to return to the city, where they might have been revived, they came instead to the hill women. They came for help in their dying. They cried for the ministrations of the women. Minister to yourselves, they were told. And yet, always, the women stood by, friends from a distance, the midwives of death, who could ease and would ease their passing. Why can't we help them, Jacques had asked. They must help themselves, the mothers answered. But they're dying. Well, yes, they're dying. That is the most important thing. That is exactly what they must help themselves to do. When they touch their own bodies, they know that. Only when they disconnect do they cry for our help and curse our hardness. Jacques had seen them die there. Four of them, one by one over the days, while she and the other women talked with them and sang with them, but never touched them, either with mind or hand. They had been unable to sustain their manness, and it was too late now for them to reach down and lift themselves up and grasp their own womanness. It was too late for them, and these were the gentles of men. What were the others like? They are driven, when Otto would say, driven in their own madness to destroy themselves and us and any living thing. Their madness? Is that like Clea's madness? No, hers was the madness of too full of vessel. Theirs is the madness of power. Jacqua had pondered all that. The meadow below her was green with its own form of winter. And there were some signs of life there. Briefly, she checked her extended ear. Still no sound. It must have been minutes now. How could a person stand so still? She turned back toward the ensconcement where the anger and the pain had come from earlier. The rhythms were quiet there now. Two older sisters had spent too much time, too many days together without speaking their hearts to the rest. She knew the pattern as young as she was. In fact, probably because she was so young, it was one of her first lessons for them all. Lightly, her memory touched the long-ago warm, soft days with Ursula. Ursula, who had been her learn together. She had not forgotten the feeling of needing for life itself, Ursula's simple presence. They did not speak their warmness beyond each other to their sisters. They had become hidden with it. It began to eat away at their freestanding selves, and hence the saying, There are no words more obscene than those that say, I can't live without you. Count them the deepest affront to the person. Jaco had not forgotten in the end, she had understood the importance of never feeling that way again. 
The present matter apparently was more difficult, though, because the two women were city-born. They had found each other there and had fled together, had been separated, and then for more than a year now they had been reunited. Among many of the sisters, there was the feeling that they had held too hard to each other and to the old ways of trying to love. Jacques would be anxious to know how the talking had come out. A clank disturbed her. The person was moving now. Jacques would turn to her listening to the resumption of the sound. There was someone else there, too. Again, she tried other senses and mind stretches. No veil. She turned as Diana came up behind her. Look with me, said Diana. They locked minds. Diana's eye-seeing, pushing outward in a way, expanding with her power. As always, Jaco was astounded and exhilarated. I'll never be able to do it alone, she said. She squeezed in the thought actually before Diana could stop her. Diana chastened her sharply, calling her up short. Jacqua took her desserts and began to focus with Diana on the scene so far away. There was the source of the squeak, a metal headpiece whose raised visor jiggled with the slightest motion. Beneath the armor and the headpiece, there was a woman. Fear sprang to her eyes as she sighted a figure familiar to Jaqua. She sighted Seja from the Western Ensconcement, and Seja was looking squarely at the stranger. The sudden noise of the helmet had been caused by the woman drawing her arm and a very smooth stick across her chest. Seja stood only a yard from her. Seja said, You are not open. The woman's eyes blazed. You don't need that armor or those weapons, Seja said. The stranger spoke no word, but her eyes were hard. It was clear to Jacques that the woman had been walking fast as if fleeing when she encountered Seja. The two were very different. Seja, with her short curly hair, cotton shirt, soft trousers and sandals, her frank face and large hands open and out to the newcomer. To the, newcomer. the stranger, larger in stature, ludicrously garbed in the costume of a range of eras, as if she had robbed a wardrobe of some theatrical company. She was guarded and burdened by the weighty chain that clung to her torso and by the old-fashioned helm on her head. Thin, skillfully worked metal formed her shoes. They were meant for feet much larger than her own. Her legs were bare up to mid-thigh except for the leather greaves. She wore a short, kilt-like skirt made up of loose metal-covered leather straps, and over its waistband was a belt, and wedged into the belt at the side was a large kitchen carving knife. In her hand was the polished stick which she now held up as if to strike Seja. Slowly, Seja moved. She sank before the other woman, knelt before her, and bowed her head. The stranger stared. If you do not understand my words, Seja said, or my mind, then understand my body. I do not wish to harm you. You may kill me if you like. I trust that you will not. Still, the strange woman stared. Quietly, Seja raised her head, looking up into the other woman's face. Then her hands and head turned to the leather on the stranger's legs. She reached out to untie one of the thongs that held the shin protection in place. The woman let out a cry, stepped back, and raised the stick above her head. Seja stopped. Then she pointed to the stranger's knife. 
The woman's eyes narrowed, and her head turned a bit to the left. She seemed to understand something. Still holding the club high above Sasha's head, she drew the knife from her belt. Jacqua gasped. Diana held her and with short stretch urged her to silence. Now Sasha was lying on the ground on her back. She forced a piece of an old log beneath her head. Jacqua was incredulous. She must be crazy, she whispered. Sasha, in the face of danger and even of death, was lying down as if to sleep. In silence, Sasia looked at the woman with the weapons, and then, with deliberate calm, she closed her eyes and pushed her head back over the wood so that her neck was fully exposed. How long they stayed there, the armored woman and the vulnerable hill woman, Jacqua could not tell. She dared not breathe, lest the stranger leap forward and slash Sasia's waiting throat. She held fast to Diana, and then it happened. There was a change in the eyes of the larger woman. She lowered her hands, the knife to one side, the club to the other. Sasia opened her eyes. At that, the standing woman looked to each of the weapons and with intentional slowness dropped each one upon the ground. Sasia rose to a kneeling position and the woman did not move. It seemed to Jacqua that they looked at each other for an eternity. And then, very deliberately, the stranger thrust forward her leg towards Sasia. With like slowness, Sasia untied the thong, and the unburdening began. Piece by heavy piece, Sasia took the armor from the body of the stranger. The greaves, the thick black belt, the monstrous helmet, so that long hair flew in the wind. And then, with some difficulty, even the chest mail. The woman moved only to straighten her arms so that Sasia could remove that vest. Seeing she wore nothing beneath the chest piece, Sasia immediately removed her own shirt, bearing her breasts in equal fashion. They stood looking at each other for a long moment. Then the face of the strange woman broke into an amazing smile. It leapt from her face to Sasia's and back again. And they stood grinning at each other. Then both began picking up the armor and the weapons from the ground. Sasia extended her hand and the woman took it. Together they plowed through the underbrush toward the ensconcement. Jacqua was breathless. Her relief slid into exhaustion. She sank to her knees and then she curled up on the brown grass. I may sleep a bit, she said to Diana. Diana nodded. May your dreams ease your wakefulness, she said. She kissed the cheek passed her hands over the young body, and then rose to descend the path.